So here's the dynamics problem motivated by a clip that you can find on YouTube. If you look under Wall of Death, you'll see this event that they have in India where you get these motorcycles zipping around in a circle and climbing up this nearly vertical wall. And not only the motorcycles do this, but also they get cars to start driving up on this wall. And as soon as the cars pick up enough speed, they can pretty much stick to that wall and drive around in circles. Check it out. So here's a dynamics problem in which we have a car driving around in this circular path along a vertical wall, just as in the so-called wall of death. We'll let r be the radius of the path of the car. We'll let mu s and mu k be the coefficients of kinetic and static friction. And what I want to do is find the minimum speed at which we can drive this thing around and around in a circle and have it not slide down the wall, right? The minimum speed. Above that minimum speed, we remain stuck to the wall. Below that minimum speed, poop, we, I guess that's why they call it the wall of death. All right, so let's start working out the problem. I've got a picture of it here. I've got the list of things that are given and what I want to find. Notice that in the picture, I have uh, some basis vectors listed here, some coordinate directions. So let e hat t be the direction tangential to the path, which is around in a circle, and e hat n perpendicular to the path that's towards the center of the circle. And another thing I'm going to do here is this, make an assumption that the car moves around this, around this loop, around the circle at a constant speed. The speed's not changing. So there will be no acceleration in the e hat t direction. So the next thing we do is draw a free body diagram. Here's my car looking down on it from above. Um, you see that curvy wall there, and the wall is going to be pushing uh, perpendicular to the wall, normally out towards the center of the circle, acting on the car. So that's in the e hat n direction. And s since my assumption the car not speeding up or slowing down, I'm not going to have any force along the wall, nothing to speed up the car or slow it down. Viewing the free body diagram, that is the system of forces acting on the car, from the point of view or perspective of a side view, looking at this vertical wall here, there's the normal force pushing the car uh, inward towards the center. I'll also have weight pulling on the car downward. I'm calling upward the positive k hat direction. And I will have a friction force holding the car up on the wall, pulling upward so the car doesn't slide down, right? So there's this lateral friction force that's necessary in this problem. And that's my free body diagram. Of course, I also need a mass acceleration diagram. Let me try to bring that up. Here it is. Again, looking down from above, from the top, I have an ex a centripetal acceleration towards the center of the loop, right, in this e hat n direction. And that's proportional to speed squared divided by radius. So that's how that looks. And again, since the car is not speeding up or slowing down, there is no acceleration in the tangential direction. All right, so with our diagrams now in place, let's go ahead and do some analysis. All right, so we're going to start setting up Newton's second law, which means that the sum of the forces acting on the body is equal to mass times the acceleration. Of course, we can decompose this into separate components. So let me start off with the easiest one. That is the e hat t direction, the, tan the direction tangent to the path. There's no, f no f force pushing us in the e hat t direction in any of these pictures, so I get zero. And as I said, I'm moving around at a constant speed, so I have no acceleration in that direction either. So this one's trivial, essentially. Now let's look what we have in the e hat n direction. You'll notice that uh, I have the normal force of the wall pushing outward, or inward, I should say, towards the middle of the circle. And uh, that's all in the e hat n direction. So this has to equal my ex mass times acceleration in the e hat n direction. So mass times speed squared divided by radius. So now let's move on to the vertical direction, the one that I'm calling k here. Again, we have uh, weight pulling down, a friction force pulling up. So let me do friction force first. Minus subtract the weight pulling down. And since I have no acceleration vertically, again, we're moving just around in just a, a circle, a constant rate, not going up, not going down. So I must have zero acceleration in the vertical direction. And this tells me that the friction force has to equal the weight in this case, right? Just to keep it from sliding down the wall. Now, a good question you should be asking yourself right now is this friction force, this one holding the, the thing up on the wall, is that a kinetic friction or is it a static friction? And I'll give you a moment or so to think about that. 
Now the answer to this question is that the friction is static. It's not kinetic. In other words, it's not sliding. It's not skidding. Uh, the point there, the, the portion of the wheel that's in contact with the wall at any one time, it doesn't slide. It comes in, it sticks to the wall, then the wheel lifts that patch off of the wall as, as the wheel rolls. So again, no sliding, so we have static friction. Now since we have static friction preventing that car from sliding down the vertical wall, then under the Coulomb model for static friction, I know that this friction force has to be less than or equal, it can't be greater than, it has to be less than or equal to coefficient of static friction times the normal force acting on the wall. Remember that normal force? Well, if I look at above, my equations above, call this one, one equation number one, call this other one equation number two, then notice equation number one, it's got my normal force right in it. So that tells me that my friction force has to be less than mu s times m speed squared divided by radius. Notice that this other one I'm calling equation number two, it tells us something about the friction force, right? Since I'm not accelerating up or down, the friction force has to be exactly equal to the weight. So equation two, this one up here, tells me that, that on the left-hand side of this expression right here, I have the friction force, which is just equal to the weight. So I got m times g less than or equal to mu s m speed squared divided by radius. And you'll notice that quite conveniently these masses drop out. Alright, so let's step back and see what's going on. Notice on the left hand side of this inequality I have just g. g is a constant. It's the acceleration due to gravity. It's 9.81 meters per second squared or 32.2 feet per second squared. Right, again, but what's important here is I've got a positive constant. And this positive constant has to be less than or equal to this expression on the right, which depends upon speed. So remember what I'm asking for is the minimum speed for which this thing's true. So the bigger this thing is, the no problem. But when we get when v gets small, notice that this whole expression on the on the right hand side here gets smaller. And the smallest amount of v that you can tolerate is the one for which uh, this thing is a strict equality. So the very smallest v is the one for which mu s, for which g is equal to mu s times that minimum speed squared divided by a radius. And now I can just solve for this v min. And I'm thinking it's r times g all over mu s. And I'm taking the square root of this whole thing. And I claim that this is the thing we're looking for, right? This, here's my v min as a function of the other given variables in the problem. And there you have it. So before we wrap it up, why don't we check the units real quick. On the left hand side we have a length over time. So we better have a length over time on the right hand side, hopefully. So let's look in there. R, that's a radius, that's a length. G is an acceleration, that's a length over time squared. And then in the denominator we have mu s. What are the units of mu s? Well remember f is related to n through mu s, right? My force, the friction force, is related to the normal force through this relationship mu s. So if on the left hand side I have a, f a force, on the right hand side I need a force to match it, n is already a force so therefore mu s must be unitless. It doesn't have any units at all. And of course we can't forget the, the square root sign. So inside the radical here I have l squared over t squared. I'm going to take a square root and that's just going to give me l divided by t, a length per time. It's a speed. So that's cool that both sides of the equation have the same units. That's important. So given that the units turn out, I have some confidence, not complete confidence yet perhaps, without looking over it again, but some confidence that, that uh, I have the right answer here. And I'm feeling pretty good about it. Notice there, there is one part of the question that asks you how this minimum speed differs for a big heavy car compared to a much lighter car. So you notice the expression that we came up with has no mass in it whatsoever. So this minimum speed will be the minimum speed whether it's a school bus or a moped. Same thing, although it might be hard to fit a school bus inside the wall of death. But you get the idea, right? And we saw this in the video, right? There were cars and there were motorbikes. These two vehicles had very different masses, yet they went around that wall of death at roughly the same speed, right? This makes sense because the masses cancel out in the problem. And just as a final check that this answer makes sense, let's do a little uh, thought experience. Let's suppose that the radius of that circle, I'm guessing that was somewhere around 30 feet. And g, of course, is, is 32.2 feet per second squared. And 
for a tire, it's common to have a static friction coefficient somewhere in the ballpark of one. In other words, the maximum lateral force that you can have is about equal to the weight of the car. And if you stick these numbers in here, you'll find that uh, the V-min is somewhere on the order of about 31 or so feet per second. And if you put that into miles per hour, that's 21 miles per hour. Or if you're someone who likes to think of it in terms of kilometers per hour, this is about 34. Yeah, so this is about right. This is about what we saw in the video. So, so I'm thinking the magnitudes at least make sense. This is cool.